this is uh, this is an I interesting topic that I got a lot of questions about from patients on a one-to-one -one basis. So uh, a couple of years ago, I decided uh, two things. One, to try to make a presentation about it uh, to answer a lot of the common questions. And uh, secondarily, um, to actually begin to look at our own patient population, because there's not a lot of data out there if you ask uh, uh, Obstetricians, I frequently get calls from KRE patients. Obstetricians, what do you do? What's the advice? Just tell me what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to deliver this child. And uh, so it, uh, it does uh, spoke, bring up a lot of interest, and there's really not much in the literature. Dr. Oro had reported nine or ten cases, and there's maybe one other extant report uh, about a small number of cases. We've, in our retrospective look, we've looked at about uh, 40 women, mostly to look at not how things went forward necessarily, but how the, what their experience was before in their childbearing years before they were diagnosed with Chiari. And so we have close to probably a look at about 100 pregnancies, and it's remarkable how well everything went. That's the, that's the good news. And so now we'll get into uh, some of the details. So my disclosures are, you know, I'm neither a neurosurgeon, of course, and I'm neither, uh, neither am I an obstetrician. You know, I'm happily married for 43 years. I have four children, two of whom are daughters, and uh, eight grandsons, one granddaughter, and one on the way in a few weeks. So uh, that's my experience. Uh, and here are the questions we're kind of going to focus on. It's a little bit like Letterman's list of 10 things, but they all get at different aspects of this. Uh, and uh, so just review this, and then we'll go into each one individually. Uh, does Chiari affect fertility and the ability to stay, sustain a pregnancy? What are the risks that my baby will have Chiari? Do I need to have surgery before I get pregnant? And what about the medications I take? And is the baby at risk during a pregnancy? Will my Chiari symptoms get worse during a pregnancy? Will a pregnancy make my Chiari symptoms worse so that I have to have surgery later? And what are the risks of labor and delivery with Chiari? And what are the options for pain control, which is an important question, and how safe are they? And how does having syringomyelia affect my uh, options? And that's really a big question. So what about the issue of fertility? So it really is no, uh, although we've talked about a lot of associated disorders in Chiari, but Chiari by itself, we have no evidence at all that we know of that there's any effect on uh, fertility, the ability to get pregnant, uh, or to sustain a pregnancy. But it's important to know, uh, as uh, our young married population gets older and older, that about 10% of couples do have difficulty conceiving, and there's certainly a lot of pregnancy and reproductive medicine centers that have opened up to kind of help people with this. Um, it often takes a number of perfectly timed cycles before pregnancy is achieved, and the chances of getting pregnant uh, with each cycle varies a bit with age. So between the ages of 20 to 25, there's a chance about 25% with uh, uh, of a couple uh, achieving a pregnancy. At 25 to 30, it gets to about 20% 20 20 chance as you get older, obviously it gets a little bit less. And after 35, there's about 10% uh, per ovulatory cycle of the chances, uh, and the chances continue to go downward as uh, as primarily the woman ages. Uh, uh, this means that the average woman under 30 will become pregnant within about six cycles or about six months with active uh, intercourse and, and normal uh, uh, otherwise health issues. Women in the early 30s on the average by about nine cycles. Uh, so uh, at, at any age, you are considered fertile if you have been having regular, unprotected intercourse for a year without conception. However, women over 35 should seek treatment probably after about six months. So those are the general things that gynecologists will talk about in terms of uh, pregnancy. What are the risks that my baby will have Chiari? Well, the geneticists talked about this a little bit. Chiari, as you know, was previously thought to be a developmental or sporadic condition, and until Dr. Millerat's report came out in 1999, where he reported about 21 families with a, a somewhat dominant uh, or possibly recessive inheritance. We really, no, no one ever thought too much about the inheritance of Chiari, but between the geneticists at Duke and a, another group in England, there are, there are probably about 800 to 1,000 uh, 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 families with uh, clearly what looks like sort of a dominant uh, history. Our experience generally is that uh, if you're 
concerned about these issues, usually the families where we see this are quite heavily populated with Chiari patients, you, you know, in the, from generation to generation, which looks kind of like a um, multiple genetic kind of dominant type inheritance, uh, not much different than maybe the tendency to diabetes, for instance, probably even in less so, less so than that. Uh, and, uh, and as the geneticists told us the other day, it's probably really a multi, multi-gene, multi-genetics. It's more, more complicated than, uh, than we uh, previously thought or, or hoped that we might have markers and, and other testing um, modalities that might help us predict some of this, but we're really not at that stage at this time. Um, so. Uh, the information success that is, indicates that, you know, there may be as high as a, a 12 percent uh, familial incidence, which is what we heard the other day. Um, do I need surgery before I get pregnant? Well, one of the qualifications for surgery is not pregnancy or not, so we really don't think about it in that way. Um, and um, as uh, Dr. Miller I used to say, we have three indications for Chiari surgery. One, intractable headache, absolutely non-functional. People that are below a Karnofsky score of 70, uh, you know, they're really not working. They needed some assistance with daily activity. So you're symptomatic enough that uh, the risks of uh, a craniotomy uh, and a posterior fossa decompression are, are worth taking because of the disability that you face. Uh, the progression of some neurologic symptoms, which might be sleep apnea, vertigo, brainstem effects of, of compression at the, at the uh, foramen magnum, uh, or a syrinx that's actually not this, just that exists, but a syrinx that's progressing, it's enlarging, and we understand that the Chiari is probably at, at the root of the problem. So similarly in pregnancy, we don't advise people to, you know, prophylactically ever have Chiari surgery if they're thinking of, you know, taking a trip to Europe or if they're thinking of having a, having a, a family. So uh, all the symptoms, all the, uh, those kinds of circumstances are driven by the clinical symptoms and how uh, affected people are. So uh, now, an interesting thing that people don't get too concerned about until <laughs> maybe you really think about it or you find out that you're pregnant is what about drugs and uh, pregnancy? And there's a, really a well-established uh, uh, classification of drugs on an A, B, C, D, X kind of scale um, that uh, the obstetricians uh, kind of go by in terms of what are the risks of various drugs. And, and the important concept here is that in the first at conception and shortly after, when all the active differentiation in the new fetus is taking place, that's the most critical critical point uh, in which we'd like not to have drug exposure. So uh, it's uh, very important to keep that in mind if you're thinking about uh, starting a family. And uh, the uh, issues are pretty easy to lay out by looking at uh, the classification of some drugs if you happen to be taking something or anticipate taking something. So the class A drugs are, there's really no evidence of uh, fetal risk that we know of. And uh, everybody can go back to the thalidomide story when thalidomide was used for a number of years uh, as an anti-nausea and it turned out to produce this focal milia, this terrible malformation of the limbs and uh, nobody wants to see anything like that happen again. But um, there are very few things that have uh, an A classification, you know. Interestingly enough, Tylenol doesn't even have an A classification, you know. So maybe low doses of vitamin D, but although there's a lot of interest in vitamin D, the obstetricians will, will tell young women to not go over, not take anything in excess of anything. So stay with uh, pretty much the FDA recommendations if you're going to supplement and all, and maybe just uh, have a good diet and, and per, uh, perinatal vitamins and take good care of yourself. Um, the class B drugs, fetal harm is possible, but it's very unlikely. And Benadryl for mild nausea. Interestingly, oxycodone and is, uh, can be taken probably pretty safely for severe headache, if, if that's the case. Uh, Zofran and Bentol are drugs that are used for nausea, and they're actually pretty, pretty safe. Uh, Class C drugs are only animal studies show any adverse fetal risk. And you have to understand that in animal studies, they give these animals maybe 
you know, multiple times the dose is equivalent to what uh, individual patients might get. So they're really pushing the issue in the animal exposure. So they, they may be relatively safe. And a lot of the analgesic medications, drugs including Diamox and uh, even drugs like Mylox and Mylanta, which are antacids, uh, fall into this category. Some, uh, and a few anticonvulsants. One of the most important ones to think about in this category is Topamax, because we use a lot of Topamax primarily because it comes into the picture because of headache management. And uh, Topamax was a class C drug, and recent evidence really in the last year has uh, shown that there, it has been pushed into the class D category, which uh, includes Dilantin, Depakote, mostly a lot of uh, anticonvulsant medications. And interestingly, you'll see snuck in the middle here is aspirin. So aspirin actually is a class D drug. This comes up as an issue with many women who are uh, actually taking aspirin maybe for uh, MTHFR problems uh, or uh, women that have had uh, maybe a, a minor kind of coagulation or inflammation problem. This is a very hot topic in, uh, in pregnancy uh, and fertility management because nowadays after the baby's born, they don't throw the placenta away, they autopsy it and they look at really whether there's inflammatory conditions, whether there's been uh, premature separation of the placenta by virtue of uh, some inflammatory conditions that actually are the, the root of uh, stillborn children in, in, the third, in the third trimester. So um, the class D drugs, there's positive evidence of fetal risk. Uh, they used to say years ago, it's not very flattering, but we used to say Dilantin produced a lot of funny, funny looking kids. And uh, there were some uh, facial structural minor abnormalities, but uh, they were some typical features. And there certainly were uh, some abnormalities of uh, fetal malformation. And uh, finally, the class X drugs are absolutely contraindication. These are mostly chemotherapy drugs. And interestingly, Restoril comes into this. And Restoril is a commonly used uh, uh, sleep medication. So uh, as you see, there's some imp important things to uh, to think about in that. And again, to emphasize the fact that we don't want these drugs, particularly in the first trimester, which means how do you know when you're in the first trimester? Not for maybe a month or two. So. Uh, you best be, uh, as everybody will tell you, no drugs is the best policy. Absolutely nothing, you know. So not always so easy to do. So is the baby at risk during a pregnancy? Both, uh, and importantly, both the mother and baby are at risk during every pregnancy. Uh, Fetal mortality in the United States is uh, not the best in the world, but it's still under 1%. And the incidence of birth defects is about one in, um, in about 33 live births. So the miracle is that it all happens pretty much OK most of the time. But still, there's a, an incidence uh, of uh, 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 problems. And not only is sex a risky business, but having children is a risky business, right? And uh, so uh, and not, only, not, not to mention the financial burden, you know. So, um, Every mother puts herself at risk during a pregnancy, so I always tell, make sure your husband takes very good care of you because you're a saint. Um, is there no, there's no such thing as a risk-free pregnancy. Uh, and uh, now, um, having two daughters of my own, uh, you know, you see that uh, uh, a pregnancy, which used to be kind of a joyful experience, is now kind of like a science experiment, uh, you know, because all sorts of genetic testing gets done uh, without many young women actually realizing it's taking place. You know, the obstetricians put a, put a sheet in front of you, say just, it's like when you go in the hospital, you agree to pay for everything, you agree not to hold anybody liable for anything and whatever, you know, you sign your rights away. But uh, there is a lot of uh, investigative stuff that goes on, and also about the management of stillborn children at anywhere, anywhere along the line of, uh, of the pregnancy and more and more investigation into coagulative problems that may uh, lead to stillborn uh, pregnancies. And, uh, the concept being now that uh, pregnancy is real, really a parasitic kind of relationship that the, you know, the uh, baby stays with you at the, at the behest of your immune system. And whatever happens at delivery is triggering really a rejection of the fetus. And that's an inflammatory process that begins. And sometimes it starts too early. Sometimes it's too involved. And it can, a plus, it can affect a placental function, which can affect uh, certainly the late stages of child development. So it's really, uh, there, 
uh, really finding out a lot more, uh, and the more you know, the more complicated things are, and uh, so it's really uh, uh, kind of interesting, and I've been shocked in my own uh, daughter's pregnancies how, uh, how involved the whole thing is, and it's kind of frightening. Uh, but it uh, doesn't stop people from getting pregnant anyway, you know, so... Um, Probably the greatest risk still, you know, to, to a mom and child is preeclampsia, which is the occurrence, which is really a manifestation of this rejection phenomenon with hypertension and coagulation problems possibly uh, in, the la in the last uh, 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 few uh, weeks or a month or more of, of the pregnancy. So, uh, but the uh, gynecologists are really, they have good mechanisms to manage this and certainly in children that are delivered early, uh, a, month, month, a month prematurity is really uh, easily dealt with and children become fine. And uh, so it's, um, uh, those are a lot, uh, those things are really in, in the purview of the gynecology folks. Uh, so uh, will my Chiari symptoms get worse during pregnancy? Well, surprising news is that it's quite the contrary. When you look back at women that we see who have Chiari, they're 45, they're symptomatic, and we look back and say, well, they had four or three pregnancies, two pregnancies, whatever, and they did amazingly, amazingly well in that circumstance. Most women, um, and the few studies, Dr. Oro's study and that, have. Uh, have, have actually had a reduction in headache symptomatology, if that's really the, which is kind of the most common symptom in Chiari. Oftentimes they get off their narcotic medications and certainly Topamax and other things, even Diamox we try to get people off, uh, and tend to follow them through with just using, you know, mild uh, analgesics or even oxycodone, which is still a little bit safe. And, uh, you know, you just have to be careful. You don't have a, an addicted child a little bit or a dependent, physically, not addicted, but really physically dependent child. But to ed take the edge off of that, that's pretty much a safe strategy even. Um, so we're still kind of looking at this experience. And the more I see it, the more you're uh, aware that... Um, uh, that it really works out pretty well. So that's, that's the good news. Uh, rule of thumb still holds that the more tonsillar descent, the more likely symptoms are to be prominent. And we're, of course, concerned as the pregnancy gets to full term, what are the issues about labor, labor and delivery and, and, and anesthesia? So I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, a lot depends on what's been done, and everybody's a little bit different. That's why it's kind of case by case, uh, the way we sort of look at it. So if you have a, a very impacted uh, Chiari and headache symptomatology, it's gonna be a little more of a, of a rough go, and we'll talk about some issues about how uh, pain management takes place uh, and dif differentiate between the use of epidural uh, analgesia or uh, spinal uh, analgesia for uh, delivery. If you've, had a, if you've had a decompression and the decompression has been uh, satisfactory and patients are uh, pretty much doing well, you really don't have any negative impact of that because uh, you can have any really pretty safe approach to uh, analgesia and labor and the rigors of labor and delivery, which is, of course, the pushing in the late stages of labor that the con concern arises primarily with syringomyelia. Uh, <clears throat> so will, uh, will the pregnancy make my carry symptoms worse so they have to have surgery later? There's really no way to anticipate uh, this eventuality, and we know that, uh, uh, or we've learned over the years that, you know, the rule of thumb of how much tonsillar descent you have is an important issue, but it, it's, the rule is frequently broken because we have people with minimal tonsillar descent who have terrible symptoms and people with 25 millimeters of tonsillar descent who never had a headache and, and they really seem to have done uh, pretty well. And I, I certainly don't really have a clear understanding of why that's the case, but you see it and then it, it's, uh, it's important. So we don't operate on just the imaging. We operate, you know, the operative approach and the management of the patient depends on, on symptomatology. And and it's the same. Uh, so we know that there are a couple of risk factors, and I went back to uh, 
Dr. Millerat's paper, and uh, there was an interesting statement in there. This was just a questionnaire kind of uh, approach to things, but about 25% uh, uh, of uh, the patients in that 365 patient survey had <clears throat> had the experience of a minor or, or not so minor head injury or neck injury precipitating symptoms. So we see this time and time again. People are fine. They have a, a head or neck injury, and it's usually, it can be mild, but it also, more frequently than that, it's a, it's a minor whiplash. So it's a kind of high velocity injury, more so than bumping your head against something when somebody gets hit from behind. That's the worst kind of injury. And we see, we see it more and more now because of all the texting phenomenon, because you know people are stopped at a red light and somebody comes, rams in the back of them. The two scenarios that are, should most come to your mind as far as defensive driving, not that you can defend against being at a stop sign or a stoplight and somebody rams you from behind because they're texting. The other is uh, exit ramps. I happen to live on Long Island. And our, so we have some exit ramps that are about 20 yards long. You know? So if you don't get out of that right lane and you're behind a rise, we have a lot of underpasses in Long Island. And uh, you know, so people come over that ridge. And if you're still in that right lane, uh, you can be a little bit in trouble. So uh, get off that lane as fast as possible. If, you, if there's a long line, go to the next exit if, if you can. Uh, because we've seen so many people get creamed in that, uh, in that situation. I went and looked back at the data about pregnancy and labor and delivery. And it sort of uh, mimics what we still kind of feel on some of this review, and that is there were about, um, about 275 women in that series, and about 16% of them have re had reported some worsening of symptoms related to the childbearing experience. So again, it's not very high number, you know, so, uh, and uh, certainly labor and delivery with uh, all the various types of analgesia and and uh, certainly with first, uh, first pregnancies, labors that may extend from six to 12 hours of, of heavy pushing and, and uh, straining and everything, they, they, it seems uh, in God's infinite wisdom, you know, pregnancy is a protected state and women seem to do really very well with respect to the Chiari. So that's good news. <clears throat> the, um, so, you know, in a general review, what little li literature there is, there's, uh, you know, not a significant cause, again, of, of really worsening your symptoms. So you uh, should take that, really take that home. What are the risks of labor and delivery with the Chiari? Well, it turns out that, you know, there are some risks, uh, pr primarily with uh, uh, the analgesia that's used. And there, I'll show you the two, three major kinds of approaches to analgesia, which certainly everybody's concerned about, everybody's worried about, you know, you hear all the screaming and yelling that goes on and, you know, what women say about their husbands, you know. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so, uh, but he, some of the risks are really per million here. Epidural hematomas at the site of, uh, of the uh, epidural or spinal anesthetic, deep epidural uh, infection. Again, we're talking about a handful of cases in, a, in per million. So it's almost close to getting struck by lightning. Uh, and um, persistent neurologic injury is really fairly rare also. Uh, we just saw a young woman in, in a clinic who had a persisting mild radiculopathy following an epidural. That probably have, but most of those are fairly transient and over a period of one or two months, a uh, little bit of back pain or dysesthesia down one leg or the other usually is uh, spontaneously uh, remits. Uh, <clears throat> where the rubber meets the road is really in the pelvic dimensions. So. Uh, the two issues, physic, by the physics of it, is that the baby's head's got to get through here. Uh, and uh, that uh, sometimes can be predicted a little bit. The whole, whole issue is called dystocia, which means the babies may or may not be able to get through that. Uh, and uh, that's uh, what is uh, what we're concerned about. So the, toward the end of the third trimester, which is kind of where we begin to make decisions about labor and delivery, uh, the obstetricians can begin to tell you if the baby's nine and a half pounds uh, and, and a woman has small pelvic dimensions and the head is normal size, they're maybe going to recommend a, 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 a controlled C and a planned C-section uh, in, in any event. Uh, <clears throat> so. 
these uh, kinds of decisions began to get formulated to really in the, in the middle of the, you know, the months uh, uh, before the expected uh, data confinement or the, when the babies thought to come. And first pregnancies usually routinely are a little bit later than anticipated, and uh, subsequent pregnancies may be uh, surprisingly quicker, and so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, what are the options for pain control and how safe are they? Okay, so IV opioids or other kinds of pain relief are really in the third uh, and the final part of the pregnancy are really uh, okay, so don't be afraid of having uncontrolled pain. Uh, regional infiltration uh, anal analgesia, cervical or pudendal blocks, which were done a number of years ago, uh, I, you really don't get done anymore. Uh, epidural anesthesia is so effective and methods of spinal anesthesia so effective that really the obstetricians don't get trained in this, you know, injecting uh, of the, around the cervix and, and, and doing caudal blocks in the back are much less done than they, they were previously. Uh, and likely, too, uh, uh, you know, the obstetricians are much less uh, used to doing it and less skilled. And the other part of it is that the subspecialty of uh, uh, obstetrical and anesthesia has risen in most university hospital circumstances. They have a separate division of anesthesia that's just obstetrical anesthesia. So one of the uh, hallmarks uh, that I usually mention to the patients is make sure you have a meeting with uh, the an uh, you know anesthesia anesthesiology team before you're going to be set for delivery, uh, so that the and also to get yourself considered as a high risk high risk pregnancy. It just gives people a little more attention. And uh, be aware of issues in, uh, in the coverage of, of uh, gynecology practices. Some of the practices may have, you know, everybody covers uh, here and there, and many of the practices have uh, midwives uh, that may do. It's probably better to have a, a, a board-certified uh, gynecologist really in attendance on the day you might tend to deliver uh, so that any eventuality can be kind of handled appropriately. Um, now, the uh, next controversy is really between epidural and uh, spinal anesthesia. So the risks of epidural anesthesia, and I think the next slide really shows, I don't know if everyone's aware of how, what's the difference between epidural and spinal anesthesia. So uh, in epidural anesthesia, the, uh, there's a needle introduced uh, It'll just like doing a spinal tap, which may be a more familiar experience to folks, and they try to get that not to puncture the dural membranes around the spinal uh, roots, okay? They're entering the needle in this area. Of course, the spinal cord is ending around T12L1, so at the point that the epidural is done, there's no spinal cord there. There are just roots, and it's kind of like putting a fork in spaghetti. So there's not likely, too much likelihood of, of trauma, although that's one of the minor complications. <clears throat> but the, the cr critical thing is that they don't go too far and puncture the dura because the spinal an a needle that's used in epidural anesthesia is a fairly large needle. It's like an 18-gauge needle. And uh, that has more risk of, if it punctures the dura, it's likely to make a bigger hole and there's likely to be uh, more uh, potential for CSF leakage following, uh, following that. And that happens... Uh, if you look at the literature, they'll probably say it's under th two or three uh, percent. If you talk to <laughs> patients uh, and uh, obstetricians, and that uh, they, they, the anesthesiologists seem to quote a lower number, and maybe it's about five percent or so in uh, in in general population. Uh, so they put this needle in, and they, then it needs to be a fairly big needle because they insert a catheter in there that they that they put in the epidural space so that they can continue to give you. Uh, a a analgesic uh, medications as the, as the labor and delivery progresses. And if you're going to have this done, it's good to have it done probably early and in a controlled situation with an, uh, a, an obstetrical anesthesiologist, not when the baby's head is crowning. They say, okay, I'm having that pain now, and they try to flip you over and put the needle back. The resident gets in there, or the medical student try to put the needle in. That's likely a prescription for disaster. So you want to have this in a controlled environment, and generally it's, it's even safe, even, even, if the dura is, uh, even if the dura is punctured a little bit, but we want to, want that, wants to, we want to avoid that at, at all costs. 
Now, the uh, spinal anesthesia, really, uh, an, a, a trocar-like needle is placed, but a very, very tiny needle. And the, the current procedures use a 27-gauge needle to enter the dura. And they then inject uh, spinal anesthetic uh, and withdraw the whole business. And that leaves you anesthetic freely from the waist down for about 6 to 12 hours. Uh, it's very good for pain control. And uh, <clears throat> it's uh, certainly under uh, spinal anesthetic, it can be pretty effectively progressed to in the, in the, if the need is there for an emergency C-section kind of procedure. The difficulty oftentimes is with epidural anesthesia, the uterus and some of the internal organs are not, uh, not, not covered as well because of the low level uh, at which the, the epidural anesthesia is put in. I think I have a... Uh, picture here. Uh, so uterine contractions and the pain from the uterine uh, elements really projects up to a higher level in the lower part of the spinal cord, which is ending here. Uh, epidural or spinal needles are entered here. So uh, epidural anesthesia is very good for covering the pain of, of cervical, a little bit of cervical dilation and vaginal dilation and epidural uh, and uh, episiotomy kind of approaches uh, to d delivery, but it may not be uh, all that helpful in, uh, in, if a C-section is necessary. So oftentimes, if pain is an issue, they will use uh, transfer over until uh, heavy conscious sedation or general anesthesia. So, so um, the advantage is, um, you know, the risk of epidural anesthesia, inadvertent dural puncture, the uh, uh, potential of abnormalities of the lower cord that have been unrecognized. The uh, tethered cord is one that comes up. So usually when we identify patients, and, and the labor and delivery happens oftentimes before the Chiari does, but we want to be sure there are no other underlying issues, of course, in the lower spine uh, that might, that this would be extraordinarily rare. Uh, the uh, advantages of um, uh, epidural anesthesia, it's an avoidance of potential airway compromise and instrumentation. Anesthesiologists are kind of loath to give general anesthesia because um, of a couple of issues. One, women oftentimes in, in the throes of the last stages of labor are, are hypertensive. These tissues are friable. There may be changes in coagulation and that they're really not anxious to give uh, uh, general anesthesia if they can avoid it. In our, uh, and we have a obstetric obstetrical anesthesia team, and because of our focus on Chiari, we tend to have from the regional area, we have a lot of, a lot of ladies that deliver at North Shore because they have a Chiari and they want to they be around where we are and the, and the anesthesia team is, and uh, they really uh, prefer to do spinal anesthesia, and we've had uh, uh, the concern for the neurologist side of it is the risk of epidural inflammation, especially with the possibility of, of syringomyelia, but that's been, with the safety of the present uh, epidural anesthetics, really it hasn't been a, a, any kind of a remarkable problem, but we need to really get the numbers on those issues. The anesthesiologists say it's so safe, it's the best way, and, the, and of course the young lady is awake and has the experience of uh, an, you know, a normal uh, bonding with the child right after delivery. And that's uh, a, an important aspect of things. So, um, so uh, those are some of the uh, uh, concerns. Uh, again, uh, the advantages of the epidural is that uh, there's greater, uh, less likelihood of hypertensive problems and uh, certainly the avoidance of general anesthesia. Now, one of the questions was, boy, if they give me general anesthesia, is the baby going to be born anesthetized? Uh, that really probably never ha doesn't happen. The, the obstetricians get the baby out within five or ten minutes, and, and the babies are, you know, the anesthesia really doesn't get to the baby enough for that to be much of a problem. So that rarely comes up as an issue. That's what the anesthesiologists tell me, you know. So, um, so um, types uh, of analgesia that prov are provided, this is stratum one is kind of... Uh, uh, obstetrical practices that are uh, really uh, sort of university and uh, large volume, and and the um, uh, you can see here that uh, 
the numbers of cases gradually uh, have, uh, have increased. Epidural, the use of epidural went from 22 to 61 in, uh, over the course of 20 years there. And, uh, uh, and uh, there's been a lot less of paracervical anesthetic use and uh, uh, other parenteral kind of approaches. Uh, the uh, spinal anesthetic, of course, is, and his has gradually increased a bit over time. Uh, because of the facility of, uh, and the safety of some of the medications and the facility of the uh, uh, anesthesiologist. So how does having syringal myelia affect my uh, options? Well, all syrinxes aren't created equal, and that's where the issue comes in. If, if a person has a, a small collapsed syrinx uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a prior decompression that uh, is, is relatively asymptomatic, pushing probably is not much of an issue. The concern with pushing is that straining and pushing has the potential to possibly rupture uh, a syrinx uh, through, the, uh, th uh, through the lateral margins of the spinal canal. But in this circumstance, that's relatively a, a kind of lower risk. So we're a little bit more, uh, uh, less concerned about that. Uh, in an individual's tiny slit-like syrinx, as you heard from Dr. Batsdorf, that this is maybe just a developmental remnant. It may not be serious at all, but we, again, are not uh, all that concerned about that. But when a syrinx gets to be over 80% of the spinal cord's diameter and it's expansile and may not have been recognized uh, uh, you know, until very recently, uh, then we generally recommend that people undergo controlled general anesthesia so there's no, no pushing. And, uh, and the baby can be safe and the mother, mother can be safe. And then we can make decisions about surgical options uh, later. As far as imaging studies, we generally, if we're going to try, if we haven't looked, and sometimes we have Chiari patients that had brain and cervical imaging, but they didn't have spinal cord imaging. Um, and uh, we, uh, in, the, in the third trimester, the pediatricians and the obstetricians really have a low, not only are they doing, in some cases, ultrasound every couple of weeks, but uh, MRIs are done pretty much with impunity and not much of a concern for the mother or, or, the, or more importantly, the baby. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, so virgin Chiari patients need to be handled with the expectations driven by prior symptoms and prior imaging, so uh, if that stuff is uh, available. Uh, there may be delivery by general anesthesia or many of the other techniques that we talked about. With significant tonsillar descent, we're cautious about the risks of CSF leakage, again with the, ep with the epidural, and possible arachnoiditis, which have the potential to precipitate worsening symptoms. Fact is that we don't really, I can't quote you cases where we've had spinal anesthesia and it actually looks like it's worsened the Chiari or worsened the syringomyelia. So these drugs seem to be relatively safe in the way they're administered and the, the likelihood of post-delivery uh, uh, post, uh, headaches and uh, leakage is with, with the use even of that, that tiny 27 gauge uh, spinal needle is uh, extremely low. We just haven't encountered it as much of a problem, but we're not dealing with humongous numbers here now. Um, so patients with syringomyelia ought not to push in a second stage of labor for fear of rupture of the syrinx cavity. And that depends kind of on how, what the syrinx is all about, and that's, that's where the important considerations lie. In addition, there's a potential risk of this chemical meningitis from intrathecal analgesics. And again, that's not been too much of a problem. So uh, in the end, the, the bottom line is plan, plan, plan. Uh, if you know you have a Chiari, make sure the imaging is done and, and sort of think about how, what your options are. And uh, be considered as a high risk designation and a practice that's used to having complicated delay, labor and delivery. And you may, uh, you ought to probably see your uh, obstetrical anesthesiologist. We had a few patients that went in and they said, oh yeah, I know what Bud Chiari is, that's a liver problem, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, you don't want to have that sort of circumstance, you know, so they, 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 when you have an anesthesiologist, doesn't know what a Chiari malformation is. So, um, and uh, uh, 
get an anesthesia consultation, see somebody up front so that there's some notes in the chart that says this is a carry malformation and somebody has either had an experience. We have a few anesthesiologists in high-risk pregnancy groups that have delivered countless patients with Chiari uh, one or more times, and they feel very comfortable with that. So it's kind of a team approach. So we're talking with the anesthesiologist. They want us to tell them whether it's okay to do this, that, or the other thing, and the patient certainly, uh, when they find out they're pregnant and they know they have a Chiari, all of a sudden these issues come to the head. So I hope I've been able to answer some of those questions. And again, it's kind of an individual thing. Everybody's a little different, all right? But by and large, things work out great. Thank you.